There are so many historians who've written about the Cold War. It's a subject that is endlessly fascinating, and there will be uh, more and more books on the Cold War, but very few people have actually stopped to think about how the Cold War intersects with the environment, and particularly uh, environmentalism. So I'm really interested in trying to figure out, did environmentalism contribute in some way to the outcome of the Cold War? Can we learn about the structure of the Cold War by studying uh, both countries, both societies' environmental values and the sets of decisions that their governments but also that their peoples made as they thought about how to use natural resources. So I think it's a study that it's an area that hasn't been really studied very much and there's a lot of fruit, uh, fruitful options here. Well, the, the historian Paul Josephson has a great line for it, brute force management, uh, brute force technology, he talks about. that The Soviets, uh, even more than the Americans, believed in big dams. They lived in big projects and pouring uh, tons of concrete rather than a smaller amount of concrete, catching every fish or every whale you can rather than smaller amounts. The, the, this idea of brute force, I think, is really important for understanding Soviet environmental uh, approaches. The Soviet Union was a poor country, even despite the size of its military. It was a country that had a huge demand for resources. And so it's understandable that the Soviets would desire to create uh, wealth out of nature as quickly as possible. I think in the long run, one of the things the Soviet use of environment, uh, environmental amenities did was reinforce this idea that the Earth was fragile and uh, probably even more than Western use of resources. Because I think uh, in the West, it was at least possible to imagine negotiating with the people who are making decisions about resources and putting brakes on bad decisions in a way that it wasn't as easy to do in the Soviet Union. And so I think people in the West saw the Soviets as part of the problem. They couldn't pressure them, but they could try to change the whole system mm -hmm. around the world. So the, the basic issue was that um, the whaling nations and the whaling companies recognized that, that a free-for-all, as they called it, on the whaling grounds was a problem. If anybody could go down to the whaling grounds and hunt any whales they wanted, that there would be a long-term problem. They would catch too many whales. So even in the 1920s and 30s, the British and Norwegian governments were talking about ways to regulate whaling and regulate their own whalers. Their concern was that they might be able to regulate their own whalers and simply open the door for other countries' whalers to go down and do whatever they wanted. So the impetus for actual international control comes from the League of Nations in the 1920s. And of course, the League of Nations really didn't get anything done effectively. So not surprisingly, what happens in the 1930s is pretty ineffective. And so at the end of World War II, the United States makes the decision that it will take the lead in whaling policy, even though the United States is not really a whaling country in the 1940s. It does it because for two reasons. One is it does have some interest in the uh, in sperm whale oil, which is a really valuable industrial lubricant. But more importantly, the United States is trying to create this system of open access to resources. And the whaling uh, commission is a way to sort of assure everybody access to the resource without stripping the resource so quickly. So there's an idea that we can have a global quota. Anybody can take part of that quota. But once the quota is hit, everybody has to stop. This is the real problem. Once the whalers have created the technology to allow them to be free of port for months at a time, it is almost impossible to regulate whaling. Uh, in the old days when whalers had to bring their catch back to an island in Antarctica, somebody owns that island, Britain, Norway, and they can have rules for what you do with the whales and they can therefore enforce them. Once they're talking about ships that are free on the high seas to do whatever they want, then nobody really has legal control. The ship is flying a flag of Norway or Britain, but if it doesn't like Norway's rules, it'll just move to Sweden uh, or move to France or move to Germany. So there's, there's really, it's really hard to control. And this is the reason why they began thinking about international control, that a nation cannot control whaling. It has to be international. And then, of course, the other is that this is, in fact, taking place in the least national part of the world. The Antarctic has, in effect, no nations within miles. Argentina is kind of close to part of it, but it's way beyond Argentina's ability to govern and or Australia's. So at least, you know, in the North Sea, you can imagine the countries around the North Sea all having an interest in the North Sea and, and ne negotiating. But in the Antarctic, it is so far from any law that the whalers, and so far from any enforcement, the whalers feel like they can do anything they want. There's a, there's a line that the whalers use that below 40 degrees south, there's no law, and below 50 degrees south, there's no God. And they were down there in the zone, been 50 and south. And so there's no law and there's no religion, basically, down there. You can do whatever you can get away with, you get away with. <laughs>
Absolutely. I think that uh, one of the big lessons is that there's always going to be a dispute about science and that we have to keep in mind that the scientists are not trained to be policy makers and the scientists are trained to offer scientific understandings, but it's up to the policymakers to make something of that. There's one moment I have from the 1950s where the, a British fisheries official is complaining because the scientists aren't giving him hard conclusions that he can use to make, uh, make policy. And I'm sure that the scientists, if they were able to respond, would have said, I've given you all the evidence you need, you just need a backbone. And it was up to the British fisheries official to take the evidence, which was pretty clear that there was decline, and actually do something about it. And so that the, the policy people are going to, if, if there's an out because there's disagreement among scientists, the policy people will, will be tempted to go for the, the weaker solution. They'll say, well, we're not entirely sure. There's always going to be scientific uncertainty. We see this in the global climate change debate, uh, very similar to the debate about certainty in terms of whaling. I also think that um, if we spin it out to other wildlife issues, we'll find that, um, that there are plenty of dis uh, discussions, for instance, on biodiversity that are fairly similar. How do you really regulate biodiversity in the Amazon? Sure, maybe Brazil could do it, but Brazil is tied more broadly to international market and the species that are of value in Brazil have international commodity status. So this is really an international problem. It's not going to be solved just by one nation. As an example, I just had the pleasure of being in South Africa a couple weeks ago, and I was talking to our guide who was Zulu from the eastern part of South Africa. We were talking about rhino poaching, and he was talking about the, the problem of rhino poaching, and I raised the question of what China is doing in terms of rhino poaching, and he just got furious. Not with me, but because his government is not cracking down on Chinese rhino poaching because his government is too interested in trading, among other things, coal to China. And if they push China too hard in the rhino horn issue, they're going to end up uh, losing their ability to sell coal to China, which they view as more valuable. So there, have to, there are constant trade-offs about how we value these species. In the case of whales, once whales became intelligent, not just a commodity, but actually, as one of my students said, they went from commodity to deity. Once they became an effective deity, then, then you have a standard for protecting them. And so to save these animals, frequently you have to make these sort of non-scientific conclusions that they are incredibly special. And then, of course, the problem with that is, what do you do about the animals that aren't special? They don't get, they don't get protected. So um, in some ways, it's not a happy story, but it is a, it's a reminder that it, you're probably going to get the best management from ecosystemic thinking, thinking about the ecosystem as a whole, but it's very hard to rally the troops around an argument about ecosystem and carrying capacity and things like that.